Chapter 1 Early Life Schoolboy Days And the Unsparing Rod A Judge of Dogs My Flint Rifle The First Cook Stove and Sewing Machine End of the World Coming My First Discovery in Osteopathy I suppose I began my life as other children with the animal form, mind, and motion all in running order. I suppose I bawled and filled the bill of nature in the baby life. My mother was as others who had five or six angels to yell all night for her comfort. In four or five years I got my first pants. Then I was the man of the house. In due time I was sent off to school in a log schoolhouse taught by an old man by the name of Vandenberg. He looked wise while he was resting from his duties, which were to thrash the boys and girls, big and little, from 7 a.m. till 6 p.m., with a few lessons in spelling, reading, writing, grammar, and arithmetic sandwiched between. Then the roll call with orders to go home and not fight on the road to and from the schoolhouse and be on time at 7 next morning to receive more thrashings till the boys and girls would not have sense enough to recite their lessons. Then he made us sit on a horse's school bone for our poor spelling, and pardoned our many sins with the sparing rod, selecting the one suited to the occasion out of twelve which served in the walloping business until 6 p.m. In 1834 my father moved from that place of torture, which was at Jonesboro, Lee County, Virginia, to Newmarket, Tennessee. Then in 1835 I was entered with two older brothers as a student in the Holston College located at New Market, Tennessee for more schooling under the control of the M.E. Church, which school was conducted by Henry C. Saffel, a man of high culture, a head full of brains without any traces of the brute in his work. In the year of 1837 my father was appointed by the M.E. Conference of Ten Tennessee to go as a missionary to Missouri. We bade adieu to the fine brick college at Holston, and at the end of seven weeks' journey reached our destination, and found we were in a country where there were neither schools, churches, nor printing presses, so here schooling ended until 1839. Then my father and six or eight others hired a man by the name of J.D. Halstead to teach us as best he could during the winter of 1839 to 1840. He was very rigid, but not so brutal as Vandenberg. The spring of 1840 took us from Macon County to Schuyler County, Missouri, where I received no more schooling until 1842. That autumn we felled trees in the woods and built a log cabin 18 by 20 feet in size, 7 feet high, dirt floor, with one whole log or pole left out to admit light, through sheeting tacked over the space so we could see to read and write. This institution of learning was conducted by John Mickle of Wilkesboro, North Carolina, at the rate of two dollars per, per head for ninety days. He was good to his pupils, and they advanced rapidly under his training. The summer of 1843, Mr. John Hindman of Virginia taught a three-months term in which mental improvement was noted. Then back to the old log house for a fall term in Smith's Grammar under Reverend James B. Calloway. He drilled his class well in the English branches for four months, proving himself to be a great and good man, and departed with the love and praise of all who knew him. In the spring of 1845, we returned to Macon County. A school was taught by G. B. Burkhart, but I did not attend it as he and I did not agree, so I left home and entered school at La Plata of Missouri, conducted by Reverend Samuel Davidson of the Cumberland Presbyterian Church. While attending his school, I boarded with John Gilbreth, one of the best men I ever knew. He and his dear wife were a father and mother to me, and I cannot say too many kind words of them. His grave holds one of my best and dearest friends. They opened their doors and let myself and a dear friend and schoolmate, John Duval, long since dead, into their home. Mornings, evenings, and Saturdays, my friend and I split rails, milked cows, helped Miss Gilbreth tend babies, and do much of the housework as we could. When we left, she wept as a loving mother parting from her children. There are many more of whom I could speak with equal praise, but time and space will not admit. 
In the summer of 1848, I returned to La Plata to attend a school given wholly to the science of numbers under Nicholas Langston, who was a wonderful mathematician. I stayed with him until I had mastered the cube and the root square in Ray's third part, Arithmetic. Thus ended my school days in La Plata. The reader must not suppose that all my time was spent in acquiring an education at log schoolhouses. I was like all boys, a little lazy and fond of a gun. I had three dogs, a spaniel for the water, a hound for the fox, and a bulldog for bear and panthers. My gun for many years was the old flintlock, which went chuck, fizz, and bang. So you see, to hit where you wanted to, you had to hold still a long time, and if the powder was damp in the pan, much longer, for there could be no bang until the fizzing was exhausted, and fire could reach the touch hole leading to the powder charge behind the ball. All this required skill and a steady nerve to hit the spot. I was called a good judge of dogs and quoted as authority on the subject. A hound, to be a great dog, must have a flat, broad, and thin tongue, deep-set eyes, thin and long ears, very broad, and raised some at the head, and hang three inches below the under jaw. The roof of his mouth had to be black, his tail long and very slim to be a good coon dog. That kind of pups I was supposed to sell for a dollar each, though I usually gave them away. When I went to the woods, armed with my flintlock and three dogs, they remained with me until I said, Seize him, drummer, which command set drummer out on a prospecting trip. When I wanted squirrels, I threw up a stick in a tree and cried, Hunt him up, drummer. In a short time, the faithful beast had treed a squirrel. When I wanted deer, I hunted toward the wind, keeping drum behind me. When he scented a deer, he walked under my gun, which I carried point front. I was always warned by his tail falling that I was about as close as I could get to my game without starting it from the grass. The old-fashioned flintlock hunting was under the Van Buren and Polk's administration, but when Harrison, old tip, came in, I possessed a caplock gun. Now I was a man. Big engine me. To pull the trigger was bang at once, and I was able to shoot deer on the run. Shotguns were not in use at the time, but the frontiersmen became very expert with the rifle. I could hit a hawk, wild goose, or any bird that did not fly too high or too fast for my aim. I killed a great number of deer, turkeys, eagles, wild cats, and foxes. My frontier life made me very fleet on foot. Brother Jim and I ran down and caught sixteen foxes in the month of September in the fall of 1839, Fearing someone will regard this as a fish story, I will explain that during summer and fall some kind of disease got among the foxes and we found them lying in the hot roads in the dust, feeble and shaking as though they had the fever and ache, and incapable of running away from us. I have never since tried to outrun a fox. As furs were not worth a cent in September, our sixteen foxes were useless. But during the preceding winter, we caught a mink and concluded to go to the market with it, as we must have a five-cent bar of lead before we could shoot more game. So I saddled my horse, Selim, and went to Bloomington, nine miles, to exchange my mink skin for lead. The barter was made with my good friend Thomas Sharp, an uncle of Reverend George Sharp of Kirksville, Missouri, and soon the hide was with other furs, coons, and opossums. Then I mounted Selim and started for home to tell Jim that I had found a permanent market for mink skins at five cents apiece. In short time, I shot a deer and had a buckskin to add to the fur trade and took my big fifty cents in powdered lead in caps. Early in the forties, I was very much in dread of the judgment day or some awful calamity. I was told of the signs and half signs that there were to come before the end cometh until my young mind was nearly distracted. Men had grown so wise that they knew just when the great wheels of time would stop, but the story of the Day of Judgment was nothing compared to a wonderful invention a great and wise man had gotten up called a sewing machine which could make over a hundred stitches in a minute. I knew it must be so, for I read it in the Methodist Christian Advocate of New York. I told my chum, Dick Roberts, the story, and he said it was a lie, because his mammy was as smart a gal as there was in the country, and she couldn't make but twenty so. 
he wasn't going to swallow any such stuff. I didn't tell Dick all the wonderful things I had heard. I wanted to tell him that Sister Stone, just four miles from where we stood, had told me she brought a cook stove with her from the east, and she could make coffee, fry, or boil meat, bake bread, make syrup, and cook anything on it in good shape. But for the sake of my own veracity, I determined to go and see if it was true before I told it to Dick. I told Father I was going to hunt stray cattle. He said, All right. Having joined the church a few Sundays before, he supposed I was honest about looking for cattle while I really wanted to see Sister Stone's cook stove and determined to let evil prevail that good might come. So I mounted Selim, and as soon as I could get out of my father's sight, I put the bud to his side.